have been, for the last number of weeks now, since the beginning of Advent, we have been spending time with the Gospel of John, looking at various texts, looking to see how it is that John is revealing Jesus as the Messiah to us. And it's been, it's been a great journey so far as we've seen these stories and we've, as we've reflected on stories that in many cases are very well-known stories to many of us and well-loved stories for many of us. This morning, we are going to be looking at what might very well be the most famous or the most well-known, maybe even well-loved story in the Gospel of John. It might even be a story or, or a passage that is one of the most well-known biblical passages, period, just hands down, we, regardless of whether you are a Christian or, or not, regardless of whether or not you've spent time in the Word, a lot of time in the Word or not. These are the verses we're looking at and the story we're looking at today is some of you know, one of those stories that I think most people have heard, most people are familiar with, most people have, have interacted with and bumped shoulders with this morning. As has been the case, I've been inviting different families to read our text and to share our text with us. Um, and this morning is no different. And so let's uh, go ahead. I invite you, let's go ahead and open our Bibles up to John chapter three this morning. And let's, uh, let's hear the words as brought to us and as read to, read to us this morning by Gary and Diana Maria. Let's listen. Hi, this is the Maria family. I'm Gary and this is Diana. Okay, we're reading John 1 through 3, 1 through 21. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel what that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher? of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you this, these are you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to, get, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. All 
right. Thank you again to Gary and Diana. Thank you guys for bringing, um, bringing the word to us this morning in terms of reading our story and reading our text for us. It's, um, like I said, it is one of the most well-known, one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible, and it contains... It contains a verse that I know for me was probably the very first verse that I ever memorized, um, which is probably the same case even for many of you. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But the question that I want us to kind of think about and consider, the question that maybe kind of drives and maybe brings a little more interest and a little bit of a twist in a sense to this passage and to this text for us is that question of as well known as John 3.16 is, as great of a verse and message as that is, do you and how aware are you, how well do you know and understand the context that that, that that gospel verse comes out of, the context of what is happening, the overall message there, the context, the overall, the bigger picture of what is happening in that, in that oh-so-famous verse is that Nicodemus, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus it sneaks off. He sneaks off to Jesus in the middle of the night under cover of darkness because he doesn't, the impression you get is he doesn't want anybody to see him. He doesn't want anybody to know that he is going to Jesus. And when he comes to Jesus, as he comes to Jesus, he says, look, Jesus, we know, as a Sanhedrin, as, as the religious leaders here in Israel and Jerusalem, we know, we know who you are. See, we know the scriptures, we know what's going on, we know what's taught, we know who you are. And I wonder, is that, is that surprising? Right off the bat, is that surprising to you? Because when you think about, when you think about the Gospels, when you think about the story of Jesus, when you think about and you see his interactions, Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees throughout the Gospels, throughout his life, it kind of makes you wonder, do these guys really get it or no? And Nick, Nick for short, Nick, Nick says, look, we, we know who you are. We get it. And then from there, after that, after that confession, after that admission, then from there, Jesus then goes on to talk about, talk about the stuff about being, about being born again. He says, look, you can't be saved. A person cannot be saved without it, without being born again. And then he goes into talking about, he, he goes to Moses. He kind of goes back and reflects on the Old Testament. And he brings up this story um, in, re, involving Moses and, and a snake in the wilderness and, and that kind of stuff and a pole and everything else. And then this passage ends, this text this morning ends with John's own commentary on what this all means. And that is where John 3.16 comes into it. That's part of John's own commentary about what, what are we supposed to learn? What are we supposed to take? What is the message of this scene, this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus? I've said it before and I'll say it again because it's worth repeating. It's worth just keeping that up in front of our minds. And it's this, it's that John wants us to see and understand Jesus for who he really is. He doesn't want us to miss it. He doesn't want us, he doesn't want something to go awry. He doesn't want us to miss who Jesus is. He wants us to see him and he wants us to acknowledge that Jesus, that, that he wants us to see that Jesus is the Messiah, but he also wants us to see that simply acknowledging that Jesus is the, the Messiah, that in and of itself is not enough. See, the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these were sort of like the people that Nick would run around with. These were, these were Jesus' arch enemies in the gospels outside of Satan, of course. But these were these guys, these were, these were Jesus' arch enemies. They were, they were the guys who were going around and, and constantly trying to make life difficult. They were trying, constantly scheming and, 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 and um, conspirizing or whatever, however they could come up and just come up with ways that they could get rid of and shut Jesus up. They, they, as we see from Nick, they, they, they understood and they recognized who Jesus was. But it's also virtually impossible, I think, for anybody to legitimately try to argue that these guys were actually saved when you see their actions and their interactions in the gospel. They, they recognized who he was, but they constantly tried to stifle his message and his ministry and to get rid of him. Salvation Salvation requires more 
than simply knowing and seeing who Jesus is. It requires more than that. And that, that is what this story, I think, is getting at for us. So let's take a look at this whole idea of being born again, because that's a pretty big topic and a pretty big focus here of what Jesus says to, to Nic- Nicodemus. And um, So let's take a look at what does that mean? He says, let's start reading in verse three again. He says, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. But how can someone be born when they, when they are old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So there's, with this term, born again, I want to admit, I want to acknowledge and put out there and just sort of deal with for a second the reality that there is a lot of cultural stuff that is wrapped up in this for us. Namely, within, within American Christianity, there is a lot that gets wrapped up and tied up with this term born again to the extent that born again has almost become almost co- sort of like this cultural identifier in many ways for, for certain Christians. So you might hear somebody say, well, I'm, I'm a born again Christian, or you might be reading articles there's been a lot of political commentary and a lot of political analysis and things like that that have gone around this year because it's an election year. And you hear a lot of talk in those kinds of situations where they, they, you know, the, the political pundits and the analysts will sit here and talk about the, the, um, the vote from the born-again Christians, those who are born-again Christians. You have born-again Christians, then you have mainline Christians, and you have whatever. I mean, it just kind of goes around. So that this idea of being a born-again Christian or being born-again somehow is somehow different. Let me be clear about something here a second. Being born again does not make you a special kind of Christian or a different kind of Christian. That's not what it means to be born again. It simply makes you Christian. That's it. That's it. Born again equals Christian. So in other words, to, 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 if you are not a Christian... You are not born again. If you are a Christian, you are born again, period. That's it. That's all there is to it. Verbally identifying as a born again Christian or verbally identifying as born again, it's become almost sort of like this cultural code speak in some ways for a particular type of of Christian tradition, namely American evangelicalism. And that's a very broad thing. That's not a specific group or denomination, but it's become this almost this cultural code word for, for American evangelicalism. But if you do not typically describe yourself as being a born-again Christian. Maybe you use some other wor- wor- verbiage, some other ver- vocabulary, some other terminology. That does not necessarily mean that you are not a Christian. It probably just means, quite honestly, that you just came and grew up and you were brought into the Christian faith through a different segment in a different Christian tradition using a different vocabulary to talk about who you are as a person of faith. Jesus here in John 3, Jesus tells Nick, he says, he says, look, in order to see the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. So what does that mean? What does that mean to be born again then? Well, it means looking back and sort of reflecting back on verse two here, it means that you cannot be like the Pharisees and expect everything to just sort of work out. What do I mean by that? So good in verse two, he, Nicodemus, he came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. See, the Pharisees, they knew, they knew who Jesus was. They understood, they, they understood, but they also had this bad habit of assuming that because they knew all the answers to, to their Jewish sword drills that they got, they just kind of got a free pass when it came to salvation. Sword drill, you know what a sword drill is? To be honest, if you're somebody who tends to identify as a born-again Christian, you probably know what a sword drill is, right? Because those, those two things tend to kind of fall and run in the same circles. A sword drill is basically just a Bible trivia quiz um, that happens a lot in youth groups and that sort of stuff. It's, um, 
It's a way of encouraging people, encouraging kids and discipling kids and encourage them to be in the word and, and, and sort of understand and learn scripture and learn the word and so you then you kind of test them and make a game out of it, that kind of stuff. Um, but they, the Pharisees kind of had this idea that because they, because they knew all the answers to their sword drills, because they knew all the answers about what the Bible says, what the prophets say about the Messiah, all that kind of stuff, that they in some way get a free pass when it comes to, when it comes to salvation. They knew who Jesus was, but they didn't believe. They knew, but they didn't believe. So being born again means that you can't just know about Jesus and expect that's good enough. Being born again means that head knowledge about Jesus doesn't get you into heaven. Salvation requires something else. Verse 5. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Flesh and spirit, these these terms, these labels are fairly common terms found throughout the New Testament to refer to, to refer to sort of where is a person's allegiance lie, where what is controlling them, what by what rules, what 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 laws, what standard are is a person sort of living by now? What is controlling them? So Jesus says, look, in order to get into the in order to see the kingdom of God, in order to get into the kingdom of God, in order to be saved, you you can no longer be living according to the flesh. In other words, you can no longer be living according to the rules and the expectations and the, ra- and the laws and the traditions and the, and the norms of the world or uh, the things that are kind of really kind of driven by sin in, in many ways. You need to be living according to the Spirit, according to the Holy Spirit, according to God's rules, God's laws, the, the, the rules and the laws of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. To be born again, to be born again means, it means experiencing a complete heart and soul and mind transformation that is so significant that you essentially become a different person, a, a new creation. It's as, if you, it's as if you have actually in some ways died and you no longer exist and instead what has happened is you have been reborn into something new into a new person, into something different. And so the big question then that all of this kind of draws us to is say, you might say, you know, it's great. You know, I want to be born again. I want to be born again. I I wish that were the case. I wish that were my my status, my situation, but, but how? How do I get born again? Get born again. It's kind of a funny way of saying it. How do I get born again? And that's exactly the question that Nick asks in verse nine. He says, Nicodemus says, he says, Jesus talked about being born again. He says, how, how can this be, Jesus? How does this work? How does this work? And then Jesus goes into an answer that at first might strike you as being a bit kind of hard to understand. It's like, okay, what exactly are you, are, you, are you saying here? And in some ways, Jesus gets, you know, almost a little bit insulting or critical, which he tends to do sometimes with, with some of these people, people like Nicodemus, for example. He says, I, I don't understand how it is that you don't get this stuff. I mean, you know all the answers. You got all the information. How do you not understand what I'm saying here? But then he goes into, ultimately, I think Jesus' answer really is made clear when we get to verse 14. He says this, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So Jesus, in order to answer this question about how, how does a person become born again? He goes to the story about Moses. And it's a story that ultimately comes and it's found in, in the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 21, Numbers 21. And the whole context there is that this is taking place during what we call the Exodus. So Israel has left, they have come out, God has brought them out of Egypt and they are now wandering around for 40 years out in the wilderness, through the desert, on their way 
to the promised land, actually it's more like it, they made it there in a couple of months and then God got angry at them and put them back out there. And so now they're waiting for God to say, okay, now you can go in. Now you've learned your lesson. Now you've, you've paid your debt. Now you may go into the promised land. So they're out there wandering around the desert. And as you might imagine would happen to anybody, they start complaining about their situation. We do a lot of complaining, don't we? I mean, for 2020. We've done a lot of complaining in 2020. We, have, we, get, we get into this mindset this year where we start talking about, man, I really wish it could just be the way it is. I really wish I could just go and sit at a coffee shop or go out to eat. Or I really wish I could go to a movie theater. I really wish I could just hang out with my friends and my family without feeling dirty, like I'm breaking the law or something along those lines. We, the, the Israelites started doing the same thing. They started saying, why did God take us out here? We were doing great in Egypt. Sure, the work, the work blew. We didn't like it, and it was hard, and we were basically slaves. But at least we had a house. We had food to eat. We had clothes. We had, life was stable, and we knew what to expect. Why did God take us out here? He took us out here into the wilderness just, just to let us die, just to kill us off. He started speaking against God. And as a result of speaking against God, God sent a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of snakes into the camp. Real snakes. That's not a figurative thing. A whole bunch of snakes in the camp. These snakes came into the camp. They started biting everybody. And, and a lot of people got really sick and a lot of people died. And so Moses went and he, he went to God and he prayed and he said, God, God, I'm, God, take these snakes away. Save your people. You know, you made promises to your people. Don't let them die and, 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 and go away and, and just sort of Sounds like an idol if you think about it. But God says, you're going to make a snake out of bronze. You're going to stick it on a pole and you're going to raise it up in the middle of the camp. And when somebody has been bit by one of these other snakes, one of these real snakes, the idea is that they need to go and look at that snake, that that bronze snake on a pole. And when they look at it, they're going to be healed. Now, a couple things have to happen in order for that to, to, to take place. A couple things have to take place within a person's mindset there. One is that you have to have, if you're an Israelite who's been bit by a snake, you have to have enough faith and you have to come to a point of realizing and recognizing your sin, of realizing that you have been speaking out against God, that you have been grumbling, that you have been accusing God of wrongdoing. You have to acknowledge your sin and then you also have to have enough faith to actually go and look at this bronze snake up on a pole in the middle of camp. Everyone in Israel, everyone knew about the snake. Everybody saw the snake. Everybody, I think, recognized and they heard what Moses said and they understood what that snake is there for and what the, what the, what the idea was there, what the philosophy was behind it. They, they understood that that snake is there in order to heal people, but, but not... Not everybody believed in the promises that God made about that snake on a pole. Jesus, Jesus tells, he tells Nick, he says, he says, you know the story about Moses. Now I am, I am that bronze snake on a pole. I'm the bronze snake. And in order to experience this born again thing that I'm talking about here, You can't just see me on the pole. You have to believe that what God is promising to do through me and through that pole, you need to believe that it's real and that it will happen. Now John's John's whole thing in his gospel, it's all about making sure that we really see Jesus, that we really see him and understand and, and not just see him, but, but, but believe in him and who he is, that he is the Messiah. John doesn't want there to be any lingering questions. He doesn't want there to be doubts. He doesn't want us sitting here kind of wavering and be like, well, you know, it's, you know, is he, is he not? What, what exactly is the situation here? And so that's then where we get into some of the commentary and that's where we get to the oh so famous John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, seeing, I think I said this the very first week of John, seeing is not believing, but believing is truly seeing who Jesus is. The Pharisees saw. They saw Jesus. They acknowledged who Jesus was. They knew who he was. They knew what was going on. But most of them didn't believe. The Israelites, they saw, they saw the snake. They knew what the snake was all about. But most of them, some of them at least, many of them, they didn't believe they didn't believe what God was going to do through that snake on a pole. Verse 19. This is the verdict. Love it when the Bible gives us statements like that. Okay, just, this is the verdict. Let's pay attention. Here's what it is. Here's the point. Here's the thing here. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives in the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. It's Christmas week. Got Christmas Eve coming up. Um, Christmas, I think, is on Friday. I think it's Friday this year. Christmas Eve is Thursday. Um, we're going to be having, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service, you know, right here live streaming. We're still going to do our regular Christmas Eve candlelight service. It's just going to be very different than what we do, so make sure that you tune into that 7 o'clock this coming Thursday. But what we're going to be kind of focusing on, the theme, the, 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 the text that our service, our Christmas Eve service is going to be revolving around, really is going to be what's referred to as John's prologue, that, that those first 18, 19 verses, something like that in the Gospel of John, where, um, where John is talking about the light of the world and the word becoming flesh and all of this, all of this stuff. The theme then becomes, for Christmas Eve this year, becomes Jesus as the light of the world, the light revealed to us and to the world. Jesus is the light. We see that being said. We see John saying the same thing here in chapter three, here in John three. Jesus is the light. And light, one of the things that light does, light brings, it brings clarity. It brings, um, it, it exposes things. It brings exposure. It makes things clear so that we can clearly see what truth is, what the reality of the situation is. The Israelites had enough faith, who had, who, those who did have enough faith to look at that snake, they were able to recognize and see and acknowledge their sin and their need for that snake, for God's promise of healing and salvation. The Pharisees, the Pharisees may have recognized Jesus as the Messiah, but they didn't recognize their need for the Messiah. Not everyone who witnesses and witnessed the crucifixion, not everybody who saw Jesus tortured and, and hung on a cross and, and suffering and dying, not everybody who witnessed that recognized their need for what God was doing in that moment and through that action and through that day. But but what about the shepherds? What about the magi who traveled probably months to fall down and to visit and to worship Jesus? What about, what about Mary and Joseph? What about the disciples? What about, as we saw last week, what about, what about the wedding guests? Who, who experienced new wine being poured out for them, new wine that Jesus created and offered and gave to them. What about you? What about you? Do you see and believe? Or are you more like Nick at night 
as one person called Nic- Nicodemus this week. What are you, what exactly are you celebrating this year? Are you celebrating just simply the fact that you have managed to survive 2020? And if you think about it, that's a pretty big accomplishment even in its own right. Are, are you still just celebrating the fact that you've managed to make it all the way through what has been an incredibly insane and hectic and chaotic year? Or are you, are you celebrating the birth of the one who makes true life possible? The one who allowed himself to be hung on a pole so that you would not just see, but also believe. So you would see your need, see and recognize the brokenness, the sin, and acknowledge and worship the one who takes away the sins of the world that you may have eternal life. Let's pray.